now, this is Arthur C. and Matt Bischoff, and we are Riff Killers Podcast. now Arthur C what is going on Roy Mayorga and you know what the crazy thing about him is before we got on yeah, with he's a super you, badass drummer dude he played <laughs> at the band shelter part of the whole New York hardcore scene and I used to do a public access show I interviewed some of the guys from shelter and this band called H2O years ago now here we are present day interviewing him on the Rift Killers podcast come on now Roy Mayorga, cool fucking dude. I've known him for a while. Um, you know, met him back in the day when I was working with Slipknot, and uh, you know, he just a, he's a fucking rad dude. He's very talented. He does film score. If you watch his Instagram, he's got the fucking giant fucking synthesizers where you gotta fucking plug him in and do all this shit. And he's a fucking amazing drummer, man. So it's an honor to have him uh, come and talk some music with us, man. Yeah, this guy has played you guys from. The dude Stone from, Sour, uh, yeah, Stone Soul Sour Fly. Ministry, uh, and even Hell Yeah, and, and yes, Roy he did the about, he did like the tribute, you know, after uh, Vinny passed away. So like we talk about that, like that's a heavy thing, like when your idols and somebody you knew and then you're filling in and like, dude, that's you know that whole Vinny Dime thing is like that's it's an emotional roller coaster. Yeah, and it's crazy. Also shit. tells us about the shittiest experience that he's ever had. I think of his life. We always page. bring you we always bring you good stories, and that's a big part of this podcast. We give you those stories you haven't heard yet. And he tells a great one about um being on tour and one of the shows, one of the craziest things that happened to him uh playing the show. So fucking check it out. Come on now. <laughs> Come on now. Hey, thanks so much, Roy. Fucking hey, dude. It's been a while. How you doing? Asking me how we both met each other. I told him we met each other through Paul. And Fucking the movie. best dude ever. Yeah. We sl- the, the whole Slipknot connection. Bringing, bringing good people together. I like how you got all these yeah, drums in the back. We did meet up a little bit before that, too, though. I was just remembering now. when You know, I used to do front of house, you know, you know, in Los Angeles in the beginning, like 20 years ago. I was working at the Whiskey and the Roxy and do some Viper Room shows. I think I met you then when you were playing with Unita. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, that's right. That's where you and I first really met. Where were you mixing at? I think I did sound for you guys the last time I did sound for Unita, and it was probably the first time I met you was, um, like, officially meet you, was at the Troubadour. Nah, dude, that was like, I love the Troubadour. The Troubadour was the best spot ever. Ago, I mean, but it that still is. was fucking epic. That's all I remember. What Lacker is that? Center. It's Lacquer Center. Lacquer... <laughs> You working on some drums? Re- you poly- takes, re- takes the hair off some drums. Chest. It takes the hair off your chest. Nice. Oh. I got plenty. I might. I might have to use that. I need some of that. So right, but, right on. So what have you been doing, man? What's like? What's going on? Well, um, it's now since the whole lockdown. Well, obviously spending the most time I've spent in a long time with my family, which has been great. Um, that is the plus side of uh, uh, this bullshit for that sure. That is the silver lining of of all of this of this uh, of this uh, craziness. Um, I've just been like just trying to do things around the house that I haven't had a chance to do for years, like reorganize all this mess behind me. Totally, um, I've been doing a lot of that myself, man. I've been working really remotely, doing some work here and there, drumming wise, session wise, um, doing some stuff for ministry and et cetera, some other stuff. Um, working on a film that I can't really talk too much about just yet but i'm working nice. on some music for, for film right now and uh right. about it in, in a nutshell man i just took up the hobby in, in uh restoring michael myers masks I've been, i saw that <laughs> Dude, that's, that's fucking sweet. sweet that's dope like, captain this is kirk a, man this is a this isn't captain kirk this is actually the 2018 uh mask that was made by oh. christopher nelson 
um, it's a it's a trick or treats mask, but I just basically took it apart and repainted it, rehaired it, and nice. Maybe that's my new hobby, my new passion. But the, <laughs> the the original one was Captain Kirk, correct? Yeah, it was a, it was a Don yeah. Post uh, a Don Post uh, mask. Yeah, it was dope, man. That's cool, man. For years, for the last I don't know, odd twenty odd years, people always get my first name wrong. I don't understand why. It's R- what do they say? O- well. It's why? Roy. I'll tell you why. When I look I always at fuck your, up your last name. Ma- it's Roy <laughs> Roy Mayorga. It's That's easier correct. to say it's easier to say Ray, like Ray from Star Wars as Roy, probably is why. That. You know, I go, you know, I should have changed my name to Ray. I no, just- no, no, no. <laughs> but, but Artie, what here's a funny thing, Artie, because you know Roy, and I totally. I was telling him before you got on here. I used to do this music video show from 92 to 98 called Urban Discipline. It's kind of like Headbangers Ball. And I interviewed H2O and Downset. And I was talking to Roy because he played drums in Shelter. And they came through Cincinnati. And I was like, fuck, man, what a small world. It's like, I mean, however, you know, 30 years later, we're sitting here now via the internet doing this shit. But, uh, yeah, he was on tour, and I guarantee you, when I was interviewing the H two O and Downside guys, you were probably in, you know, fucking hanging out, hanging out at the bar. So, well, welcome, dude. I, I'm stoked, man. And, welcome, and you thank said, you so much, man. I appreciate it. And you said you work on movies as well, like like I you do. have a movie score coming out, but I you can't have, talk about. Yeah, yeah, I do have something I'm working on currently, and I have done a couple other things before. I use uh, I use a lot of modular synthesizers uh, in my work, mixed with uh, some uh, um, orchestral sample lab- libraries, and kind of mix it together nice. and do my thing with it, you know, and just kind of you know help tell the story. Basically, I'm working on a short serial killer thing, so I'll hit you up for some dark themes. I'm interested, music. definitely interested in that. Yeah, I do. I'm doing uh, what kind of sparked it is I, I, I'm i doing a cover of Katy Perry's Kiss the Girl, but I changed it to Kill the Girl. <laughs> I changed the chorus to that. So like I'm doing the video where it's, you know, I mean, you listen to the I didn't change anything in the lyrics except the chorus where it's like I killed a girl and I like not. And then everything else, all the verses make sense. So that's like some serial killer stalker. So I'm yeah. doing the video for that. But I'm like, I kind of want to do like an extended version where the video will be part of it, but then it might be like, you know, whatever, a short 10 minute kind of fucking serial killer kind of thing to tie in the video. I don't know. Just trying to be creative and do things different. You know what I mean? Get some, get some other uh, interesting things out there. I got a tractor ready and all that stuff. Uh, well, that'd my be friend sweet. Jessica. Yeah, man. You know, I, same thing. I'm, just, I'm trying to utilize the time of being, you know, whatever, new society way of living of being creative and, and using the time to like shit out yeah. as much stuff as i can never um, thought while i can <laughs> yeah man it's uh it's a crazy thing you know it's uh, uh okay i'll ask you some uh things on that like uh what's your view on like drive-in shows and all that shit because like you know we're we're musicians this is what we do our whole industry is completely decimated where we make our money i mean i'm on i i I play in bands and then I do the production side, as you know. So, you know, everything that I do is like, um, what's your thought on like these drive-in shows? I don't, I don't have any real opinion on it yet because I haven't, I haven't experienced it. So I'm not technically qualified to really make any comment on it, but I can, I can give you my, my opinion on the, on the idea of it. I think it's cool, but will it work for every kind of genre of music? Not really. No. I mean, so what are they going to do at a metal show? Have a demolition derby race in the begin in the middle for mosh Dude, pit? Probably. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I, I wouldn't doubt it. That's like why I wouldn't doubt it. Right there. Because it's I mean, weird. <laughs> Sorry, because it's weird because how they well, do them. Crunch. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> Not yeah, yeah. Death. Bring yeah. bring your beater and you can mosh in your fucking car. That'd be dope. <laughs> it's weird how they do it too because some you know they do four walls video screens great some have like a pa and audio but most of them now are doing they're fucking just sending it to your car stereo so that it's kind of defeating half the purpose of going to a live show to hear it live when you're sitting in your car with your fucking stereo on i get it, it's a drive-in but it's like so you would honk your horn instead of clap I guess, and I get it where they save the money on not having to rent the fucking line array, the PA and all that stuff, um, where they're just, you, just you know, hear, they you can mix really it. Bad, really and bad send it. stage volume then, basically. Yeah, <laughs> man. I'm going to go to one just to see. I'm like, 
I mean, I haven't gone, but I still have an opinion. I think it's like, I mean, at least they're trying, I guess. But uh, yeah, I mean, is but, it, is, is it going to turn into the new norm and destroy more? If you were to go to something a little bit more lower key and not like, I can't picture a metal show like that. I no. can picture Dude, maybe well, like more adult it, contemporary kind of show like that. Like, say, they just did Metallica yeah. and it wasn't even, it was just you parked and stared at a 40 foot video screen and watched Metallica. Like, and it was but, 150 bucks a car, dude. And let me just tell you, so I'm friends with Barry Stock, guitar player for Three Days Grace. So they had the opportunity, which was cool for them, to oh, be the opener that, right? yeah. for the Metallica thing. But it's like, it was 150 bucks a car. And I had friends like, hey, you want to go to this shit? And I'm like, man, I mean, I would, I love supporting bands and musicians and friends of mine. However... The, I was telling Artie this, the $9 that I fucking spent for the down NOLA reunion live stream show was like the best nine fucking dollars I've ever spent in my life. It was like two hours long. The first hour was like behind the scenes interviews of how they recorded their first record, man. And you're like, wow, like, because sometimes people think that because you're Phil Anselmo from Pantera, you're this guy or that guy, that you live in this mansion and you have this rock star life. But some of these guys are like, dude, we were in the fucking basement on a four track recorder recording fucking demos. So it's dude, like that first record is epic. It is. And it puts some reality to that. And they did a beautiful live stream show. And I would support that all day long. If every Friday night, dude, there was like, you need a, or soul fly or whatever i would be doing that but the drive-in thing because i don't know Artie. i mean yeah i haven't weird. experienced it but it and i don't think it's going to be the new fucking norm dude there is no way i hope not it's it's very weird and now they're doing um i think it's in europe where they're doing you have your own little like eight platform. by eight platform that you sit on i mean that i can understand better and a lot of people that i know are like oh, i think that's great yeah. Or like you know, I have my own space. I hate the crowd. Da, 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 da. I get that for those people, but it's like still like I'll play that all day long. Work it? Eh, I'm not fucking sure. I don't know. I'm trying not to work you know it. I, play, mean, but... I will reserve my real opinion about it until I actually go. So I actually go experience it myself. But I mean, I guess it's a good idea. I just don't. I just can't see it. Happening. Yeah, it's it's, it's forever. It's, and I, yeah, I hope man, it's temporary. And I hope you know we can get through this and kind of get back to normal. You know. Absolutely. It's a, uh, it, 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 it's a crazy thing. <laughs> and it's so crazy where it's like, everybody's so divided. Everybody, it, there's, there's no, uh, you can't have a different opinion except your own. And that's, what's really sad about all this. It's kind of really, I don't know, showing a lot of true colors in society, you know? Well, yeah. I want to stay off Facebook, dude. It's like, and oh, Facebook's like a like a, like a, a dinosaur now because everyone's doing book. Instagram this, but it's just like every yeah. single time I go on there, whether it's talking about a band or politics, I'm tired of it. I want to get back to fucking yeah music and going to shows and someone K like Ketanese. you, Roy. So you're obviously not touring. You're doing some work on movies and stuff. Yeah. Are are you working on any? projects like what are the current bands that you are in right now um not with anybody right now i mean I'm, i guess i'm technically still in stone sour but we're so in, what's we're, up with stone sour what's the, what's not, this i saw the permanent or possible permanent hiatus indefinite hiatus indefinite hiatus I'm not sure when we're gonna exactly get back onto doing it because of you know right now we're just taking a long break Corey's doing solo thing that's gonna. I guess gonna that depends on uh, how well his solo record does. It's gonna do fine. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna jo he's gonna jump back and forth between solo and, and Slipknot for now, you know, and that just leaves us to go off and do whatever we want to do in the meantime, you know, and when there's a time to come back to it, we will. Yeah, man, rev it up. But that's not gonna that's not gonna stop you from if you get an opportunity from somebody to play drums. Oh no, absolutely. I mean, if there's an opportunity to go play drums elsewhere, I'm going to going to go do it. Of course, I mean, that's what I do. I, I love to play drums. I live to play. You know, it's what I what I love to do. If I have the chance to go do it somewhere else, absolutely. Yeah. So what other like bands besides obviously Stone Sour was a big one. When when did you join Stone Sour? Were you were you there at the beginning? No. Uh, well, they started in 1992, and 
They put out their first record 2000, 2001. I came on, oh, 2002, they put out the first record. Um, I think they, they got together right during like one of, a break that mm-hmm. Corey had from Slipknot uh, during Iowa or after Iowa or something like that. Yeah. And then I came in. That was like their high school. That was Corey's and Jim's like high school band back in the day. So, so they had like the original guy for a while. And then, mm-hmm. so, so you know, it got popular and he couldn't handle, I don't know. He, there's, you know, very of like what and... happened. Yeah, man. You know, drinking this, that, and the other. Yeah. Dude, shit well, happens, you know, because it's like, yeah, uh, seriously, that was like their high school band. You know, what I mean, like even back in the day, they did a battle of the bands. It was Slipknot and Stone Sour, back way, back, way, way, way back. You know what I mean? Yeah. And Stone Sour won. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, dude. Like back, and that's where like they for you know, I talked to Paul about this a lot. So you know, get all the old like like the shit people don't know where. That there was some way back battle of the bands, um, and that's where they, they saw Corey because he liked what he did because he kind of did both scream and sing and stuff like yeah, that. Because yeah, at that point, <laughs> yeah, man, you know, um, same you thing make, with Jim too right because <laughs> Jim's not the original guitar player too. You know what I mean? So same thing with that. Like they uh, they kind of handpicked you know. Corey. They they had the other guy that was you know more just rah, 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 and yeah. that wasn't working out. You know the first made feed kill repeat whatever um but it's a trippy story it goes back that far you know so you're I mean? saying the same battle of the band slipknot and stone Sour. Way back. that's that's crazy because you see like on instagram how like tom morello and adam jones from tool yeah. are high school buddies and yeah. it's like well, it's crazy to see how yeah. these bands blossom with just yeah. guys that are high school dudes and then they yeah. become big fucking rock stars. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's uh, you know, say like the, the desert rock scene, whatever, Caius, Queens of the Stone Age, you need all that shit. It's kind of kind of the same thing. Were but you I, ever into that, Roy? Like, were yeah. you ever into I mean, obviously artists from the desert, you know, I, I, I was a big Caius fan, um, Stone Rock, this, that, and the other. Did you ever get into that whole uh scene or just like enjoy that music back in the 90s yeah i mean after i heard kaius in the 90s you know my my girlfriend at the time was really into him and that's how i got to know them and got to know about this whole desert scene and stuff like that it was great i loved it and being from new york hearing that is like wow it's like faster doom metal basically. <laughs> right totally Fuck yeah. yeah it's great that's like blue cheer on steroids yeah totally <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah which i love already so then i hear i hear a more modern version of it it's like great you know it's got a it, it's got all their little bits of uh you know a little bit of danzig in there there's a little bit of sabbath even though josh will say he never listened to sabbath or something or sky will say he never listened to sabbath like, do you believe that how can you no. Oh, no. how can you not listen <laughs> even if you fucking i mean give me a fucking break I mean, whatever, dude. Don't get me started on that shit. Sabbath <laughs> album, up, up to Heaven and Hell. Those, those yeah, are, man. I have that that decade. It's the fucking gra- holy grail of metal. It is the king of dude, metal. I love the weird shit, like Never Say Die and all that. I love those records where people are like, oh, I don't know about that record. I fucking it. Right? Thrill of It All. Like, Thrill of It All is my favorite Sabbath song. I love that shit. I like Technical so I like some of it. I actually, I actually learned to... Not learn, but I grew to like technical ecstasy a lot later than yeah, I did then. Right. My worst one is uh Born Again. That has gotta be the most god awful I record. Haven't, I haven't I even heard hear that. The hero. Come on. You never heard it? Listen to I don't know, dude. I just I like hero to hero. I, I listened like- to the other day because me and Buddy were talking about that. I'm like, dude, that's just it's just so bad. I got sonically everything. Got into the-, the singer. Ian Gillen? No, man. I I just dude I had a little bit of I liked Deep Purple back in the day, but it just never like and his vocals. I mean, if there's a fucking track I should revisit it, let me know. But I tried the yeah, other day, me and my buddy were talking about that. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna listen to it. And I just put it on. I'm like, oh god damn. You know, it was just so I don't know. Sonic the mix, everything was just like, okay, it sounds weird, like a lot of like cocaine, I guess, of course, but uh it's just uh it's weird so you're from you grew up in new york so obviously when you played in shelter you went from kind of like the background of like i'm assuming some of the new york bands 
like I said, when I saw you, you were on tour with H2O, and then there's Sick of It All, Biohazard, Life of Agony. I'm sure you kind of grew up kind of listening to a lot of those bands that weren't necessarily metal. But, and then in your grew up listening to bands from New York, I really wasn't growing up. I was listening to more like Agnostic Front and Chromags, Reagan Youth, stuff like that, like more in the 80s New York mm-hmm. hardcore stuff. I was more growing up listening to Sick of It All. And whatever was local, you know, like being, uh, what else, uh, underdog, you know, Bad Brains, they're not exactly a New York band, but they were in New York. They lived in New York th- that whole uh, decade of the 80s. So I was considered a, a New York band, though they're from D.C., but they were my, my favorite one of all. Mm-hmm. Nice. Fuck um, yeah. I didn't, Bad I didn't just grow up in New York, though. I mean, I was born there. I lived there until about six and then I lived in Florida for a couple of years. My father had a, a job offering down there and we lived in Pennsylvania for like six years. And then I moved to New York when I was old enough. I was about 16, 17. I got there. Mm-hmm. Something like that. Wow. And then so what, what was then, it like growing up there? Hang on. And then I stayed there till about 99 and then I moved to LA. No, I'm still what playing. was your big what was your big break? Let's get we'll get that. What was your big break, your big first like how you really started, you know, going hard drumming. Um like the story of the catalyst that like you knew this guy and you got the gig, the audition for that, boom, boom, boom. You know what I mean? There's always that crazy story where the, the chain actually, of events that actually started, believe it or not, with with Mackie from the Crow Mags because he was playing drums for Shelter. And then he ended up leaving Shelter because he he was going to go do the gigs with um, with fun loving criminals. So I got a call from him, knowing that he knew that I was looking for a gig, and he told me that you know Ray and Pristel from Shelter were looking for a drummer. I'm like, oh great, I know those guys already. He's like, yeah, nice. go here's here's their number, give them a call, and you know go go jam with them. And then I went and auditioned for them, and I got the gig. And then with Shelter is probably the first band that I ever played. One of those big European metal festivals, like Dynamo, was the first festival I ever played in my life. It was a hundred thousand people there. Me too. Never, never, never in my wildest dreams I ever thought I'd be playing something like that. Because I went from playing, you know, VFW halls to CBGBs and places yeah. like that, you know, all through the late '80s and '90s. And then all of a sudden, I'm playing in front of a hundred thousand people in Holland, opening up. Yeah. For- I mean, I never would have imagined that. So that was basically the band that I think that started me on that path. Right. Yeah, that, that was actually my first like big European festival was Dynamo. Yeah. Same shit it was like ninety nine Dynamo Metallica headlined and fucking yeah. you know we headlined one of the the side stages and all that shit. But it was just yeah. like fuck. That was pretty cool. There was a lot of good yeah. bands in the bill. I think White Devil was on that bill, which is a uh, Paris and Harley from Chromags, the post post Chromags. Um, who else? Venom. <laughs> yeah, dude. I think Typo Negative was on this as well. And Siv, you remember Siv? Oh yeah, Gorilla Biscuits. Siv's uh, the other band he had. It was mm-hmm. him. I think Carcass was on there. Neurosis. So many amazing bands on this bill. And then fast forward like a year later, um, playing with Max in Sepul, not Sepul- not Sepul- Tora, uh, Soulfly. So yeah, he wasn't called Soulfly yet. It was just him and I. He had five songs. We're just just fucking duking it out. How did you, uh, how did that relationship uh, come about? Same thing, like mutual friends. Hey, this guy's going to do some different stuff. Yeah. I mean, well, the thing is, I'll, I'll do a little backstory to that. Um, Max and I actually met each other like 91 or 90, 91 or 90, whatever the, the year the new Titans on the block tour was, they, they were on tour with like Napalm Death and Sick of It All. We met each other through mutual friends there at a, the New York show. And then we just kind of kept in touch for years after that. And I've done some work for Sepultura in between that time. And when we got together, when I got together with Max, like I did a couple remixes for them at the time, like early nineties mid nineties was like really popular for, for engineers or anyone to do remixes of songs that already exist. Really? It's like an Dutch industrial mix or a dance mix or whatever, put your spin on it and, and the band will, they like it, they'll put it out. So I happened to do one for Sepultura for Reviews Resist, only as a test because I just bought this new sampler at the time. It was an Akai S1000, and it wasn't. I mean, today's standards, it's it's a, it's a dinosaur, but back then it was, yeah. it was the, one of the best sounding samplers. 
So I sampled the intro to Refuse Resist, and I started creating this like whole weird tribal Brazilian uh, uh, samba style techno thing around it, and I thought it was pretty cool. So I started building up on it. I made like you know a good three minute version of it, and I sent it to Monty Connor, their A and R guy, who I've known for years. Yeah, uh, I remember Monty. Because my band at the time, Thorn, was signed to Roadrunner through uh, Howie Abrams, but I got to be friends with Monty. We had a lot of mutual friends and he's, you know, he's just, he just got on really well and he was their guy. So I sent it to him and say, Hey, why don't you send this to Max? See what they think. And they basically said, yeah, man, keep going with it. Here's the reels, go to the studio and take what you need and make a real wow. version. And then after that, they put it out and they actually used my remix as their intro to refuse resist when they played live, which I thought was pretty cool. That's rad. Yeah. I'm a big Sepultura fan, dude. Me too. And I, and I think that I find, did. Did it ever come out on a like a a CD single? The Refuse Resist thing yeah. that you did. I think I have that down in my music room, dude. Because that was a time, like you said, when you had remixes and everything was kind of new, like mixing that kind of shit into music. Yeah. And yeah. I, I believe I have that, which is another fucking crazy small world thing. But it's on dude, the it's on a it's on an extra on the roots D, on the roots CD, I think. And I think it came out later when they re reissued uh, the, the Chaos CD, uh, uh, CD. It's on there. It's also on the Mortal Kombat soundtrack, which I was pretty stoked. Dope, dude. And I already got Dope. the license to that. I was like, yeah. That was things. a nice that was a nice paycheck, too, right? It's all right. Good, good money is is TV and film, man. Actually, Absolutely. it wasn't really because it, it's it what? wasn't a new song. It, it's 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 Sepultura's. Ah. I just, when you do stuff like that, you get paid a fee. Or you work out whatever you need to work out in a contract and you get a cut of something. But I never really got a cut of it. But that's okay. I wasn't in it for the money. I was in it for the art and the love of it. Yeah, that's awesome. I remember I did that. uh, I did a remix to Edita song, too, back in the day. And uh, John loved it. He's like, oh, yeah, it's great. And we put it on, like, a a vinyl B-side. And then it turned into, like, a whole, like, band drama because the bass player at the time thought it was fucking stupid and lame and like because brent bjork said that's lame and then so he changed his attitude and it was like this whole like band drama because there was a remix on like 500 limited vinyl like wasn't it on a c so i think crazy. i have a cd already of like that's uh so from like meteor city or so it was a compilation and uh, it's like the I don't last know the remix. I think we did the maybe we. I, it was Wet Pussy <laughs> Cat. I did a remix of it. I thought it was cool, man. It was the same thing, same era. You know, it's all in Rob Zombie and shit. Yeah, fucking White Zombie, oh, all, like, yeah. remix. And it, me and my buddy did it. It was fun as fuck, and it came out cool. And we put it. I think we only put it on vinyl. Like we did a red vinyl limited edition thing as part of the the, the regular black vinyl and all that. And it, you know, it was just like a cool thing. Hey, it's you can only get it on the vinyl. It's only five hundred copies if you got it. Fucking yeah. cool stoked, man. Mm-hmm. So I was stoked. It was just like later on, it was like this whole hoopla band BS. Like, really, guys? Like, what? You know, like why 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 now? Oh, and then you're changing your mind like now. Like, whatever, dudes. <laughs> So that's how you, yeah, the, the drama of the shit. But dude, it's like, crazy getting with Sepultura. So you knew Max, and then that led into the whole Soulfly deal. Much, much later, years later. I mean, I didn't. We didn't know that any of this was going to happen or go down like that. You know, um, one of the last times I saw him, though, right before joining up with them a year later, was when I was on tour with Shelter. We played a couple shows with them. Uh, in the, during the festival season, we played like Ross Gilda, and I, I think we played like Pink Pop with them. And so we saw each other around. We saw each other around then, and I remember him and I talking. He's like, "Man, we should do something one of these days, man. I really like the remix, man. We should do some stuff like that later, man." I'm like, "Yeah, it'd be great. Let me know when you're ready." And then when he quit the band, um, he, I, he got in touch with me through Monty Connor, and that's how we connected. Nice. And, then, and, I, and he sent me like. A four song demo which had eye for an eye i think uh what's the other song eye for i no and fuck, back to the primitive but it wasn't on it wasn't called back to the primitive yet it was called something else which was which came out on the second album later but we did have those songs and then we kind of put songs together during that time and then we got a bass player then we got a second guitar player 
then Ross Robinson got involved, and then we started really, nice. you know, putting the songs together and then went and record them. So what year was that? So this is like before people were like really trading and doing shit in their digital home oh, studios. There was, there was none of that back oh, then. Yeah. There was no, if there was Pro Tools, I think it was called Sound Tools, but I don't think that was really uh, perfected very well yet. People were still recording to tape and yeah. and still recording in the same room together live like we did that Soulfly record. Like those are real takes that you're hearing. Yeah. With a couple punches here and there. Um yeah, it was all analog tape. We all sweated it out in a room, fucking playing these. Absolutely. Over and before over. Pro Tools was digital tape machines. I remember Ross got a when they were doing Iowa because that's when we were doing you got the in, in Sound City. He got a digital tape machine. And that was like the big hoop. Like, oh shit! Yeah, it was like, like that. Yeah, dude. <laughs> they brought it in. It was like a big deal the day at Sound City. Yeah, they brought yeah. it in. Like, oh shit! Ross bought a fucking digital tape. Like, what the fuck? It's digital and it's tape. Like, whoa. They still they still good though. The, the converters in those machines yeah really absolutely sound great yeah i yeah. remember just being like whoa <laughs> that's yeah. the next how day we... it's useless well that's not useless you... but that's how i reacted with the first time i ever seen an ssl uh solid state logic console with flying faders moving yeah and to me that was like wow that's how crazy you... See, my buddy he had like some ancient or ancient, ancient, like first version of flying faders where it was on like, you know, some PC. I don't even know what with like, you know, an ancient screen, you know, it's all green little faders and he would ride it and it would auto it would uh, fly and fader that way. It was a trip, man. And right. he kept and he kept trying to find like because that computer would die and he kept trying to find him on eBay because this was before, you know, like. Pro Tools really took off and stuff like that. Like ADATs and shit. We did a bunch of stuff on like ADATs. I got one um, over here hanging out. It's dude! Still it's still it sounded works. great. It's, 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 just all, it's, it's They're tools, man. It's all you how to use it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if you are good at it or have a brain or whatnot, that you can figure out and make that yeah. sound good. Yeah, yeah. man. That yeah. shit's all crazy. So I got a question. Um, Slipknot, did you audition? No. What? Why not? I I I thought you would be probably a shoe in. They didn't ask. Hmm. Interesting. Well, they do you probably think maybe because they're trying to keep them separate to a point. Yeah. Well, or maybe they just didn't think I could do it. I don't know. I didn't get asked, so that's okay. Yeah, yeah. What do you think of Max? I mean Jay. I mean Jay. <laughs> His dad's cool too. Sorry. He's, yeah, well, he's fucking amazing. I mean, yeah. he's killing it. That's I remember nice. meeting them. They came because we did, uh, when I was, you know, with Paul, we did the Conan O'Brien show, and then we played somewhere in New York, and they came. Like, I remember yeah. all that shit vividly. It's crazy. We're like, you know, he came dressed as Corey. Fucking all, he was like, what, eight, nine years old or some shit? I was like, yeah. oh, this kid, that's awesome. It's his and birthday then, yesterday. He just turned 30, man. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, he's super badass, man. It, it, it's so crazy. That's a very trippy story because, you know, that was like his favorite all-time band. He was so into it. And then to like replace, I guess, his idol. It's a uh, – it that shit trips me out. Like I've seen him a bunch of times. And he's – I got a weird view of it too where like to me, he's like too perfect. Like he plays everything too perfect. I don't think so. I think he has a. I think he has the swagger. I mean, I've seen him play it live. Um, he's he's got the push and pull. It's different. Yeah. To, look, at the end of the day, no one's going to be like Joey Jurison. No one's oh, gonna absolutely be like, not. No one's going to be like, no be like this drummer, that drummer. I mean, to try and imitate someone's personality is near impossible. You can play it like it, but it's never going to be the same. Well, you definitely want to be yourself. Well, and you can only be pay yourself. Pay tribute to what you're doing, but then definitely be yourself no he's fucking amazing like when i first saw him yourself. do it and I yeah like, i mean jesus he's, christ he's, he's really doing great like with as far as melding his personality and joey's on the on the joey songs i think he's doing fucking great yeah yeah i just remember when i first saw it, i was like wow man he's just nailing it like almost better not better but different because what i liked about joey i mean i've seen them a thousand times i Sure. St stood behind Joey fucking every night for you know yeah. God knows how long. And like yeah. he had that why what I liked about him, or what I I guess maybe I don't know, maybe I'm biased too, because whatever, but he had that wild abandon. You know what I mean? Because some nights, dude, he was just fucking 
too fast, you know, because when I, when I filled in for Paul too, one of those things like playing with it was like, holy shit, dude, it's just out of control tonight. You know, he had that wild abandon where it wasn't always a good thing because he would just be so fucking like, wow, shit. And, that's, you know, that's the beauty of, of absolutely. Of I love that though, man. It's, it's uh, the, magic, it's the magic of those of, of the vibe of those songs is the fact that he was off the rails, dude. And some some nights he was the it first was... album, those first two records to me, are, his drumming on that is 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 gold because of that. And yeah, I, know, I noticed it straight away. I'm like, God, this is like not your typical metal drumming, it had yeah, the punk fuck you attitude behind it every hit and so i was like yep yeah, that's yeah that's it, uh, it was you made a fucking impact dude for sure absolutely man it's uh, absolutely and if it wasn't for him you wouldn't have guys like jay fucking dude being, not at all you know, man so jay is just a product of what i'm talking about yeah it was uh it, it was a trip it was it was very um i don't know i just for me it was because i was so close to those people where it was just like it, it was a trip too but it was very um i don't know i'm glad they kept going and doing stuff um i don't know what do you think roy it's, of the current yeah. state of like just rock music and metal in general like i'm 46 years old and and i always think back of like Dude, the fucking, you know, Pantera and Sepultura and Alice in Chains and Slayer and all this and that. Like, the current state of metal, what's your kind of a, opinion on it? I'll be honest. I mean, a lot of it's starting to sound a lot alike. So I can't. it's hard for me to really differentiate who's who sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I think that also comes down to how the, the bands are recorded these days, too. Yeah. You know, it's mixed. A lot of Absolutely. people use the same drum samples. They use the same method of, you know, mixing and compressing, you know, the master yeah. and stuff like that. It just all starts to sound a little bit alike. Um, I don't know. I mean, but there are some great bands out there that are coming out. I mean, I really love Code Orange. I mean, they sound different amongst everybody. With that being said, I really love Meshuggah. They sound great. Oh, fuck know? yeah. But but most of it, I'm I'm noticing I'm not I'm noticing it's starting to sound really similar. I'm like it, it is. It's I think a technology. Gojira, oh, fucking a man. Oh dude, yeah, those guys. Kill oh, it. One of my favorite newer metal metal bands right now. I mean, I, yeah, I they kill them. it. They're they're phenomenal. The brothers are great. Everyone's fucking awesome in that band. Mario is phenomenal in that band. It seems like uh, you know, like anything else, technology helps and hampers. Because like you were saying, how it's a lot of like drum replacements or they're using the same drum samples or packs. I was talking to my guy that's mixing my record and that's kind of what we're talking about. Cause we're more, you know, I use pro tools, but I try to use it as tape. You know I mean, I might grab the drum fill on the first take cause that's better than the last take and just shit like that. But I'm not fucking beat detective and just making it super anal. I mean, we use a click. Sometimes we don't, you know, for metal, you, you do that. I mean, for metal, I think especially metal, it should be organic. It should have a push. Yeah, absolutely. It's rock and roll. You know what I mean? Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, for some bands, that to the grid, perfect like sound works, and it's great. Yeah. But not for every band, though. You know no, I mean? not at all. Not for because he band. was talking about how some of the stuff he gets, it's like even all the guitars, it's like it's just DI, and then even how they process the DI, like they're processing just the raw di guitar part not even like an amped mic or not even a modeled or profiled like just the raw di and they're compressing it a certain way and they're editing it a certain way and they're eqing it a certain way so they get that you know we whatever the jagenters or whatever you want to call them where it's a whole crazy process that they're doing that I guess makes sense to them, but you know, cause he's kind of old school. It's like, you know, let's mic up a cab. Let's try some heads, try the different speakers, which I like to do. It's fun. It's kind of the, the organic process, man. Let's try this head. Let's try this. Let's try these mics on this snare. Let's try this snare. Look, I, I, I get it. I get it. You know why that process is definitely necessary. I mean, for time constraint and for people who are working remotely, I guess you, you resort to something like that, but absolutely if I have a choice to make a record. I'm not going to use any of that. 
No. Recorded exactly how I've always been trying to be recording records. It's just real drums, yeah. mighty guitar amps. If you go yeah. to mix, um, you're going to use samples on your drums. Yeah, people always use samples on the drums, but in the last 20 years, samples have been the drums. In the yeah, past, like like everything. In, yeah. in the past, in the, and I think some engineers to this day still will use will use the real drum sound, but use samples to trigger the reverbs and yeah. to lay underneath the natural drums to give it some more more solid. I'll, I'll use it sparingly, where I'll have a yeah. sample just to reinforce. You know what I mean? Like That's say the snare. Yeah. I'll have the real snare, and then I'll just yeah. use a snare sample underlying a little bit to give it. A little more whack or crack, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. Yeah. Like so where it's so not it's just trigger, the sample. The reverbs just to give it more ambient, trigger ambient reverbs. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I like doing that. That I like doing. Yeah, and that you know, it, 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 you're still keeping. I mean, that's like an old Andy Wallace trick. He would do that. that is, like way back. Exactly day. where where yeah. that came from. It's totally Andy Wallace trick. Yeah. Andy did that. I think uh, Brendan O'Brien did that. I, yeah, it was like that. They they did all that stuff. Andy Wallace is the king of that. Oh, totally. Yeah, you can listen to a lot of his records. It's like that, that same snare. To this day, I still sick. use his records as a reference when I walk into any room to mix. Like, is I, I know his, 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 his mixes. I, I love his mixes. He's it's a cool. fucking man. Totally. He's I, I watch his tutorials all the time now. <laughs> Best kick drum in the business. That's what I always say. Yeah. So is it a drag for you, Roy, like not being able to tour Stone Sours on hiatus? Like, is it kind of like, man, like what what is next for me? Um, like, what's my next project? What's my next band? If if Stone I'm Sours on hiatus, not to, I'm trying not to think that far ahead because I mean, I would drive anybody nuts to think that far ahead. Mm -hmm. I only live in, think about living in now and just deal with what I have now. What I have right. now is what I told you. So I'm just going to just walk the path like I've always done and just whatever comes my way, I just try and take it on. Now, do you play every day? Like you're a drummer. I mean, do you sit in a fucking room in your house? I'll see the drums in the background mm -hmm. and just fucking jam out. Like For the most part. Yeah. I try to play at least a couple hours a day, just put my headphones on and just, and what are you playing to? Are you playing to records? Like, do you ever? I'm play, just fucking... I, just, I just play to what I feel. Like, you know, if I start start with sixteenths and just kind of build around there, I don't know. I, it's different every day. I don't have a real routine of what I play to. I mean, I should play to some more records and stuff because that's what I used to do. What we all used to do when we first started learning our instruments, right? Yeah. Um, but I like just just playing free, you know what I mean? And then if I find I'm, I got something good going on, I'll turn on my system and record it. And Fuck yeah. And it for later and write some guitar to it later. And so it do again. you play guitar in addition? Like what other instruments besides drums do you, are you like? I play, I play guitar, I play bass, I play piano, I do synthesizers, um, a lot of different like odds and ends. Like I can mess with a saxophone. I can play different percussion instruments. I can make some weird ass sounds on a violin. <laughs> yeah. I played sax. <laughs> so did you, like my, my son, who's, he's actually 14 now, is taking guitar lessons. He, mm -hmm. he fucking loves it. Like what initially got you into being passionate about music in general? Well, in the beginning, I mean, with, with, getting drums was the was the first thing and that was a more instinctive thing i didn't like sit down one day and say i want to play drums you know it's more like i just kind of went to it or drums chose me or whatever um but my mom noticed that i had this rhythm thing going on so she's the one that kind of pointed me in the right direction and then i figured it out on my own who i was or what i wanted to be when i saw it on tv you know seeing like buddy rich on the johnny carson show I'm like who the hell is this right I'm five years old and i'm like this guy's old as fuck and unbelievable. So after that, I'm like, okay, I want to do this guy. Then I saw Kiss on Mike Douglas show. Then I saw, <laughs> then I saw Led Zeppelin on on uh, on you know whatever, John Don Krishner or whatever. Whatever I saw them, I saw yeah. them the same. And then I saw Kiss. You know, I'm like, okay, then I'm, I'm sold. You know, yeah. I heard Kiss alive for the first time. You know, when I was six years old, and then from there on, that's where I was like, okay, I want to be that. I want to do that. And that's what kind of started me on the path. Does it trip you out? Like, By the way, look this alive is 45 years old today. Nice. Damn. Wow. 
I had that's my fucking kiss insane. Phase. So that means I've been playing for 45 years. Uh, dude, you're talking about you know a, a Buddy Rich and old dude. Look at Tommy Aldridge, man. He's like fucking 70 or some shit. He's 70, he's, and I saw him. And he's like Bruce Lee. Homie, I saw him three years ago, four years ago when I was on tour drumming for his ministry. We played with White Snake at one of these festivals. He was fucking unbelievable. I'm dude. there. With, I'm there with seven other drummers yeah. watching him, and we're all looking at each other like, "Yeah, we suck." Yeah, he's yeah. fucking insane. I want to be this guy when I'm 60, you know, four, Dude. So he's 66 at the time and still doing that drum solo like he used to do in you know, uh, uh, Black Oak, Arkansas, that same drum solo yeah. and fucking just killing it. Like, yeah. I've never seen anyone hit so hard like he does and so, like, on, on it. Like, his fucking pocket is ridiculous. Yeah, he's he used phenomenal. to live out here. I got a crazy Tom Miller story. He used to Love live it. out here in the desert. And dude, he would—you'd always see him either. He had a red Beamer, like the M3 back in the day. Yeah. It said TA drums. You saw him driving that, or you'd see him on a bike, like a you know 100 speed, whatever. Head down, you know, fucking hit throw out Hair the back like of his that. helmet, <laughs> dude. And he's going like a thousand miles an hour on the bike, <laughs> just crazy. Like, oh shit, start And cool he was cool as shit. And he rented a room for me because I have my studio where I'm at is like seven different rooms. I used to rent out the rooms back in the day. Um, yeah. he was doing some private lessons out here. My drummer, Mike took some lessons from him. So like he needed wow. a place to jam. He needed a place to rehearse. He was doing some like instrumental guy in France and whatever somebody knew. So I got him. I'm like, dude, absolutely. Like me and my drummer, Mike, we met with him. Yeah, Cause he was cool, man. He was chill. We'd see him wherever. And he He's was very teaching cool. at this, like this drum shop. And so we went like minute, minute storage. And we're like, holy shit. He opens his storage. It's like, you know fucking just cases and cases drum. and cases and fucking <laughs> to the roof and we're like helping them pull out this rad Yamaha red set and we brought it up in here and helping set him up and shit and dude serious I would sit here while he was jamming and he he would go like four hours and not stop like see, you just hear him yell once in a while like fuck because then he was using like a uh, like a disc man to play with the tracks you know this is fucking 20 years ago mm-hmm. And it would skip sometimes. Can't skip. <laughs> and the CD would skip, and he would fucking you hear him go fuck because it piss. But dude, he would go solid. Like swear to God, dude, nonstop, just for like four hours, like straight. I'd be sitting there going, God damn. You hear him fuck up still of the night, fucking million times. Yeah, yeah, he was doing some like uh, French guitar player guy. So yeah, yeah, he would. <laughs> and he'd come out and like, I go, hey man, you're right. Now? Oh, things keep skipping. I got him some foam. I'm like, I'll oh, put it on this. Fuck it. He's like, oh, dude, that worked out. Thank you. Fucking like two more well, hours straight, it's, it's nonstop. Triplet quads. He's the king of the triplet quad yeah. fucking drum fills. Like, yeah, and the fucking huge influence, man. Huge influence. Dude, I he's one of my favorite all time. Me too. Like me and Mike, my drummer. You know, like just it's like fuck, cause he kills it, dude. And like everything he's done is, you know. He's got some crazy. He told us like some crazy stories and stuff. Really cool man, cool dude. Yeah, super cool fucking dude. And like, you know, um, and he was a nice guy. You know, that's when we just were started doing Unita, and you know, like offered us advice and stuff. He's like, hey man, well this that, and make sure this and this and that and fucking, <laughs> da, da, da. yeah, cool. Because you know, he would like go into you know the Aussie shit and get all pissed off and fuck them and. They called me to do Black Sabbath. I told her to go fuck herself because blah, blah, blah. You know, they burned him so bad. You know what I mean? I heard. Yeah, crazy shit like that. Yeah. But like, That's they wanted bad. him to re-record the, 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 who did this? Was it Ansley? Who was it? Kerslake? Lee Kerslake, right? Did, um. Ansley Dunbar and Lee Kerslake. Ansley Dunbar and Lee Kerslake. So he was, even way back then, like, I forget, uh, the manager played it to him. Hey, man, what do you think about this? He's like, dude, this is great shit. What about you? He's like, hey, you think you can re-record those drums he's like dude it's perfect why would you need to record like even way back then they were already trying to like cut those people out anyway business bullshit speaking of stories okay part of this i like to hear some stories what's like uh what's a good what's a good tour story you can tell you know what i mean whether it's just like at a fucking crazy show or just you know rad food i know for me touring is like what's here that's good let's eat it or you know seen one of your favorite bands just like it's a, a good tour story okay the worst thing i think that's ever happened to me how about that oh fuck yeah. sure <laughs> anyway. oh, i'm scared I'm scared okay, okay go ahead 1998 or 99 i was with soulfly 
who played the Trocadero, um, two songs in, I ripped my nipple ring out with my sticks. Oh, <laughs> how do you even do that? Did you have a giant ass nipple ring? Uh, well, big enough for it to, for the tip of it to go into the yeah. hole. So you, had a hoop, you had a hoop, shit. not like a straight oh, bar. Yeah, I'm right. An idiot, I had a hoop. Uh, fuck. I shirt off wow. of the fucking summer. It was, it was hot as shit in there. So I'm like, fuck this, no shirt. So I'm, I remember counting in a song. I can't remember what it was, but I remember I kind of did one of these. Yeah. And this guy went They're right. Really special. Mm hmm. Yeah, I love it. it out. And I was like, oh my God. Wow. I saw my ring a slow motion kind of fly that way and I looked down it. And then this this fucking chest went nice. fucking blow the snare drum. And I can remember the guy, um, this guy Rat, who was teching for me at the time, saw what happened. He took a water bottle, like threw it on my chest, toweled it, and then electrical tape over my nipple the whole the rest of the show. <laughs> and as the show was going, I could feel the sweat just go inside the cut, just burning oh my burning. god a that was a second and song I, in i remember i had to just carefully take that tape off and like dress it and it was like it was talking it was open yeah i didn't need any stitches i put a butterfly in it and then for a week later it was back to normal it was wow. a, one of the worst things did oh. you put a nipple ring back in after that oh, no way no no that was no, ripped okay yeah i'm like fuck that shit yeah, that's insane. That would probably woke you up. It's completely healed up and normal. So, but oh, it, nice. It I used to have mine done. It just fell out one day, and I lost it in the shower or something. And then I'm like, yeah, fuck that shit. That was a big thing. I had both my nipples done, and before I had kids, I literally said, "Fuck this, I'm taking them out." Because you know, because, <laughs> oh yeah, they're yeah. just gonna rip it. Because I had the hoops too, man, <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck!" And dude, getting my nipples pierced was like the worst. Fuck, like I remember going and getting one pierced i wanted to yeah. get them both done i was like after one i was like dude i can't that that's it i'll get the other one pierced like down it's the road the, like two weeks of like you know everything touching it hurts is the bad part not the <laughs> initial piercing I whatever putting the soulfly record at indigo ranch they had a piercer guy come by and like with everybody that's when i got mine done oh wow and then you gotta track some drums and shit after yeah, you yeah, yeah. Uh, the so far the inspiration it's <laughs> the <laughs> motivation Pain. So after, so you played the whole set with your nipple ring completely ripped off. Yep, blood and heavy then, metal, dude. It's rock and roll. Did it? Did it really set in the pain and the like reality of the situation when you were done and you're like on the bus or whatever? Yeah. You're like, oh fuck. So what? Walk us through what happened. Like you get done with the set, your adrenaline's pumping. You're like, fuck yeah. The band come over like, holy shit, dude, what the fuck? They're like, they're like, whoa, it's fucked up. And that was it. You know, they don't do uh, I can remember, I can remember walking into the bathroom, just kind of like, ah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and then taking, taking the, taking the, taking the, you know, I'm going, ah. Uh. Uh, yeah, totally. <laughs> dude, that shit hurts. <laughs> that shit's gnarly, man. Absolutely. <laughs> I just took water and just went, ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Imagine some lucky fan probably has your fucking nipple ring. Yeah, totally got it framed on the wall. It's under the stage and it's probably still there. Yeah, right. Uh, that's good shit, man. That's a good one. That's uh, that's heavy metal, man. Blood, blood oh. guts, food poisoning. Oh, that's got to be good. I played a show that at. That was amazing. Uh, actually, that was with Stone Sour. The first time I came over with Stone Sour to Japan it was in 2006. It was during the Family Values tour we we're doing with Corn. So we had like a week that we had off. So we flew over to Japan to play, I think, Summer Sonic or something like that. And we got there the night before. I went out with our tour manager and a couple of the road crew guys, and we went and had Korean barbecue. Didn't think anything of it. But I had steak tartare with a quail egg on it. Raw oh, egg, raw shit. steak. Another stupid thing that I did that I hadn't realized. You just come from a 13 hour ride, your immune system and your level is low. You should not be eating anything like that, but I didn't think anything of it. Yeah. The next morning, oh, man. Up my whole, the whole day. So we had a whole day, and then I was able to stay Yo. in bed the whole day at least, and then play the show the next day. I was wow. a fucking mess. So when I went to go play the show the next day, it was 95 degrees outside. It was <laughs> in the afternoon. So I was throwing up in between. Every fucking other song. My oh my god! In the bucket. So every song. Ah, 
I got remember uh, looking back at me. He's like, "You cool?" I'm like, "Yeah, kind of, sort of." Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, that's brutal. I soldiered it through for 45 minutes like that. Power hour, man. At least, uh, yeah. yeah, at least it was a short set. Have that's you ever crazy. done that, Artie? Yeah, Art fast. I played it really fast because I, I just couldn't relax. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I remember going to Japan. Same thing. For people out there that don't know, you travel, man. These long flights, man. It's brutal. It takes a toll. You're eating different food that you normally don't eat. You either are blowing out your ass or you're constipated. I remember flying to Japan. Who was it with? I think when I went with Limp Biscuit. And I got, the, you know, it's like, what, what, 13 hours or more, whatever the hell it is. I forget. Yeah. yeah. I remember I get out. I'm like, all right, cool, man. We get in the airport. I'm like, oh, I got to piss. I go and I'm taking a piss. And I coughed. And I fucking shit my pants. <laughs> just like, I'm taking a piss. So like, you know, you, all your parts are relaxed. And I just went like, <clears throat> and I was like, what the fuck? I just <laughs> shit my fucking pants. Like That's full tough. on, like. Enough where I had to take them off and throw them away, clean myself yeah. up. Like, lucky I didn't get on like my other clothes, but like I had to, like my underwear. We're like, oh, what the fuck? Like, that sucks. Threw them away, cleaned myself up. I came out. Hey man, I just shit my fucking pants, taking a piss. What the fuck? You know, because yeah, you're on that plane, and then I'm sure I stayed up the whole night before because, as you know, flying out of LAX is like brutal, man. It's like a traumatizing event. You know, I mean, I'm out here in the desert, so I'm like two hours away. So I leave like, sort of God, like six hours before. I'd rather did sit you, at my gate for two fly, hours. Did you fly out of the airport where you're at, the Palm Springs? No, because there's no any kind of direct. I did it one time. Another biscuit story. We we're doing the. It was like the first tour I did with them. They're like, yeah, man, where do you want to fly out of? Somewhere local. That's cool. I'm like, they were cool like that. Like, yeah, fuck yeah, fly me out of Palm Springs. Okay, cool. So they flew me out of Palm Springs, but it was Palm Springs to LAX. Stupid. Oh. Wow. And my luggage didn't transfer. I had to like get my luggage and then like recheck in. No. Nah, like so I grabbed my shit. I'm like run, and they only gave me like the small window, and I'm like oh, I'm running over there. Hey man, like oh no, it's already closed. Like what? Do you like a plane time? What do you mean? They already closed the gate. I had to call the booking agent or the travel agent. Hey man, what they're saying this and like they're giving the phone and they're like what? No, no, no. They got me another flight. But I'm like, oh great, my first tour with these guys. I missed my flight. I didn't. Well, I mean, it wasn't my fault, but I was like, I'm gonna be the asshole that missed this fucking flight. I've I mean, done yeah, that a few times. Sucks. Yeah, man. It was like I've never <laughs> missed a fucking flight. I mean, luckily there was like you know we were doing a week and like it was weird. We did like a week of pre-production in like Switzerland or some shit, which was rad, but. I'm just like, but they got me a better flight, but it was just like, so there's not really any like, it's going to be Palm Springs to LA or Dallas, Fort Worth. Like you got to go somewhere else and then get your real flight. So it's not really worth it. But so I would just drive to LA, but I would leave like, swear to God, six hours and just park or whatever, get dropped off and check in. And I would, I don't care. I'll sit at my gate for two hours or have breakfast or whatever. Or get. It. I'd rather do that than like, eh. I've done it where like I barely made it because I left four hours earlier and I barely made it because I hit morning traffic and this and that. And then you got to park and then you got the shuttle and I'm like, fuck, and look at my shit. And like, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the one thing about America, man. Our public transportation, shit like that. Mm -hmm. You've been to every airport in the world. Like, yeah. Some, some are dialed, like Sydney. I stayed in Sydney after a tour, took the bus to the train station, took the train station, the three stops. Got on a different train. Dude, that train went right into the airport. You got out. You walked up the you went up the escalator. Check in. Like, why is an LAX like that? You know what I mean? Like LAX is terrible. It's like a nightmare. Like, oh shit, this is fucking it's many people, man. Chaos and chaos. Yeah, man. So I always it's such a traumatizing event. I would just I'll leave so early and just sit there and really breakfast be early. in the morning. Oh man, yeah. I hate yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm early, not really early, man. early bird catches the worm, as they say. Yeah, so, man. I'm so, Roy, guy. I, I want to ask you. So, you played some, in, in a time with Hell Yeah. So, explain kind of how that went on and and what that meant to you as a drummer, filling in for the man. You know, we all loved Pantera, Vinnie Paul. Uh, what was that whole deal like? Well, that phone call definitely came out of the blue, man. Um, that actually Chad called me, asked me about that. And actually was only intent to play just one show, a tribute show. 
uh, at least to see how how they felt about playing shows period without Vinny because I mean it's it's fucking that's heavy man you know they lost, yeah, man. they lost their friend and they weren't sure if they can even you know get back on stage after something like that you know and, and it took a lot of a lot of guts and courage for them to do that but they wanted they felt that they needed to do this for him because they worked all together so hard on that record and that record was going to come out they just want to honor Vinny and just you know hold it you know carry the torch for him and his legacy so they did um memorial show for him in, uh, like may 11th or something like a may 10th and they called me about about doing that in like february so i had like a few months to like really wrap my head around uh Vinny's parts and, and just in his vibe in general because he's just such a different kind of player he's, he's a really unique yeah player i mean this shit ain't easy like a lot of people out there may say it is but it's not he's got his own style where he like to the point where he leads a lot of his parts with his left though he's a right-handed drummer you have to do certain things how he does it otherwise it's not going to sound right but whatever um not whatever but the other the other point i was trying to make no that's awesome you know, diving in that deep off, for sure off track at first when chad called me and he asked me i i actually was kind of like i don't know if i can do that and i just you know, didn't think I could one pull it off, and two, I just thought it was too weird. You know, he was my friend, and I just felt kind of odd. And I go, look, I'll think about it. You know, and I thought about it, and I gave him a call. Okay, look, I'm in. He's like, okay, great. Well, here, learn these songs and yada yada. It was just, it was just rough. It was hard, man. You know, um, I, had, you know, it was, we, we were all, we all just knew each other for the longest time, and it was just a weird. It was a weird situation, you know. I get choked up just like, thinking about it. It's bizarre. He's not here anymore, you know. Yeah. It's, yeah. So did it become? It was, I just felt a lot of pressure too, you know. At first, you know, it's like I just, I just want to do him. I just want to do it, do the right thing, do him right. You know, I mean, I really yeah. want to make this as perfect as possible for him, for the band, you know. So, so is that one of life's greatest honors? for you as a drummer out of all the bands. I mean, you played in a lot of fucking bands. Say, yes, absolutely. 100% was one of the biggest honors to, to, to be, to have. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's what awesome. life is all about, man, is, is creating these experiences and man, that's some heavy shit, dude. I mean, for you to be able to like have to vibe on it. Do I want to do this? Do I don't? And then you to agree to do it. And then the emotional toll it takes to rehearse for it and pull it off. That's fucking awesome. It was heavy, man. You know, and just, and just to see them go through their emo emotional roller coaster. you know, we all went through it together. I went through it with them and helped them, you know, just, yeah, you know, it was heavy, man. It's fucking heavy. And I mean, every night I, I'll be playing with them is you know i'm obviously focused when i'm playing the show but there'll be some times in the middle of the show where i'm like i can't fucking believe this you know yeah that i'm he's gone and i'm here doing this and that always hits especially when they show the tribute video that, that we showed in the middle of the song in the middle of the set so yeah it always hit home you know wow yeah he was a super cool dude i have super uh cool dude the coolest fucking guy ever man he had the most infectious laugh I mean, he walk into a room, man. He like you, you, you know it. He lights it up. You know, yeah. it's always a cool. That's how Paul was, man. It just he just had that big so. bundle of love and joy. You're like, yeah, very is. much so. A lot like yeah. Paul. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's that. That's that's something special that for some reason has to go. Him and I got pretty early. cool towards towards the end. You know what I mean? Like him and I like really saw eye to eye and bonded on a lot of cool stuff, a lot of bands, a lot of music, and just life in general. You know, and I always saw a, a really, you know kind spirit in that guy in absolutely both, in both I, mean, I didn't know him well i always of course run into him working and touring and stuff and like one of my cool like i don't know of course i was a huge pantera fan and all that shit one of like the cool yeah. things i guess kind of fanboy thing is like we had a day off i was with godsmack and it was uh i think it was labor day weekend memorial weekend and we yeah. were in, te so we went to his house in Texas. He was having, you know, the barbecue and the pool party and shit. And I was like, well, fuck, I get to go to Vinny fucking pause. It's not barbecue. You know what I mean? He's always here about like, oh, it's barbecue and shit. I'm like, wow, we're going to go do a fucking Super generous. 
Dude, it was fucking amazing. Like me, it's when Ty was with uh, Ty Zamora, you know, Ty Alien Ant Farm. He was working with Godsmack too. He was teching. And we went, and it was just like, you know, it was one of my like, whoa. Because I, you know, it was one of those things, you know, you working and playing, it's like you meet all these people. Oh, cool. Yeah. But that was like, wow, we're going to, all right. Yeah. The pool party. Fuck. Yeah. They're barbecuing and all the crazy shit and the pepper with the, he's like, oh, no, no, you got to put some jelly on that. Here, hold on. And you're like, oh, yeah. The jalapeno some, pepper. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, put the jelly on that. He puts the jelly on it. Yeah, and now eat it. I'm like, oh, my God. Fuck it. How'd you know? That's so big great. Off with that. Like, I, I can remember being on, on tour with, with Hell Yeah when I was with Stone Sa- during Stone Sour and you, you know, it was hell yes, don't sour disturbed or something like that. He would cook out for everyone every night. Yeah. Like, it's like all this rad, night. amazing thing. And he did that for me. I'm like, oh, you got to put that on and try this. I'm like, some chicken and fucking just jalapeno peppers. It was, it was like a party at his, at his, uh, yeah. Night. It was just so a down cool. to earth guy. Just, yeah, yeah. just like you'd hang like, out in your neighborhood. Totally. Cool I was even like nervous. Dude, he, the, the wit on that guy was just, yeah, it, totally. He, yeah, him and his brother had that wit. Yeah. <laughs> I was even nervous. Like, I'm like, Ty, what do we do? Like, do we bring something? Like, I just want to show up. You know, you know, like you go to somebody's house barbecue, you're like, oh, we gotta bring some beer or something. Like, what, what do you gotta do? Like, mm-hmm. do we bring it? Do we not? Yeah, let's get some beer. Like, fuck, we got an empty hand. But he'd be the person to tell you don't bring anything, but we, yeah, always, totally. we always bring something anyway. Like, so we, we 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 bought a bunch of beer and we showed up. We're like, oh hey man, oh, thanks a lot, man. So much we got some beer. Like, oh yeah, I just put it in there and there's like you know, a hundred ice chest cram full. Like he's just super generous. <laughs> yeah, man. Beer, man. It oh, was cool. They jammed, you know, they got up and jammed. They said they said up a little you know thing and everybody jammed it, it was cool it was one of those where like wow that was pretty dope dude i gotta get the vinnie balls house and barbecue and he put just one of those lifelong pepper. fucking yeah, things man, man. Like, like that crazy you'll never shit. forget i can yeah. remember the first time ever meeting him I, I was um again with soulfly we played ozfest in milton Keynes bowl and it was pantera soulfly anthrax food fighters wow black sabbath the killer bill I can remember wow. playing when I was playing Soulfly. We opened up right before Pantera. I can remember seeing Vinnie Paul and Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins. <laughs> like literally ten people behind me watching me with a shit eating grin on all three of their faces. And I remember turning around and hitting water. And I was like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> like, hey, now you that's know, come on, you know, Vinnie with his come on. Like, yeah, you know, now that's the story. That's I mean, epic that's shit. I met all three of them and hung out with them like the rest of that night. Like it was Vinny, Dave, and Taylor. It was fucking awesome. It was one of the coolest days ever, you know. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, that's cool. That's like yeah. uh holy shit. Yeah, it was definitely a holy shit moment. I was like, oh my god. And they just well fuck up, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I had a little bit of thing like that when we were doing the Anita record, like Adam from Tool. Would come to the studio because like Sky, he was buddies with Sky. He was doing our artwork and stuff, and I was doing guitar shit. And like he shows up one night, which was cool. He was an awesome, dude, man. And uh, I didn't get nervous a little bit at first. I'm like, holy shit, it's fucking out from Tool, and I'm not doing my guitar shit. Holy I heard shit, he's pretty guy. cool, dude. He was super fucking cool. Where like I got a little nervous, and I'm like, you know what, fuck that. I just got went into like, all right, Adam from Tool, you want some guitar? Here you go, man. <laughs> and it was <laughs> rad because like it inspired me to like I'm gonna fucking shove this up Adam's guys- ass. I, don't, I never met the other two. The only two guys I've I've met and I do know in the band is, is Maynard and um and uh, Danny. It's a nice. Danny. I see him a lot more because he yeah he's it. super cool too. Yeah, great great drummer as well, man. Fucking phenomenal, dude. Insane. Like we got to uh we would we went to the rehearsal um place the the place where Danny used to live. You ever been there? When in Beachwood Canyon. I forget. It's like he lived there too, and then that's they were rehearsed, and then he finally bought a house. I don't think he lives there anymore, but he did. No, yeah, because he was telling me a story. He's like, "Dude, I go, dude, this place is insane." I go, "I kind of have a smaller version out in the desert," and he's like, "Oh yeah, I love this." He's like, "I finally bought a house, but I kind of like here better because yeah, he had the little loft and like he all this drum, you know, that's where they rehearsed and all that kind of shit." It's really Last fucking dope. We talked about his synth collection. Or we talked about our synth collection because like he's a. Another drummer that likes synthesizers, like I, I do. Like we just geeked out about. Yeah, man, I watch your your, your posts on that. It's dope. He's got a lot of good stuff. He's got like old EMS synthes. He has a, a real Studio Fifty Five uh, Moog modular and stuff like that. He's Red. got all crazy odds and ends. So Red. what is yeah, next for you, nice. Roy? Like what is next for you? So Stone Sour's on hiatus. You're doing stuff for movies. 
Like where can people like look forward to seeing some of what you're doing coming up? Well, I mean, the only, the only thing that I, the only platform that I use to kind of let people know that I'm still alive and still doing stuff and active is on Instagram. So if you want to know anything of what I am doing, Instagram is probably the best place to look of what I'm doing, my latest thing or whatever. I'm always on there announcing shit or posting things that I'm working on or just examples of stuff I do on drums or on my synthesizers and stuff like that. But I think the next avenue for me, since everything is kind of like, like down now is just get more behind the scenes and just do a lot of more film scoring. That's kind of been my, my secondary passion other than drums. I mean, for as far back as I can remember since the first day of really like paying attention, being, being my attention being grabbed by a, a film score, which would be the shining. Yeah. When I first saw that in the theaters, I mean, like, I was like, who the hell is this? And, but I didn't realize it was an amalgamation of, it was many different composers on, on one record. Like the main one was uh, Wendy Carlos, who did the opening theme and a couple uh, incidental tracks in there. But everything else is all modern composers. Like, Dude, uh, I love that Wendy Carlos stuff. Uh, That's so like crazy. Bartok and Christoph Pendereski. So that pretty much set me on the path of wanting to do film scores. And of course, John Carpenter. Like yeah. his scores for Halloween and The Fog and Escape from New York, you know, The Thing, all those those movies to me were, I mean, in, very impactful and musically as well. So that's basically what put me on the path. Now, what is your Instagram at? What What is your handle? Roy Mayorga Official. I only chose that name because apparently there's a bunch of other Roy Mayorgas out there with Instagram. <laughs> yeah. So, and when can people, we talked earlier about there's a film that you're doing a score for that you that's can't talk about yet. Right. So when do you think people are going to be able to I would find just out about, about this right now? Because I really shouldn't even be talking about it. But I'll just let you guys know. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I'm doing in, in the coming months on your, via your Instagram. Months, you'll, you'll know as soon as I get, the, get the green light, I'll, I'll let everybody know. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Is that that's with, uh, Oh my God, brain fart! It's a mutual friend. God damn, what's his name? He produces movies now. Can't really Paul's talk about it. He was Paul, Paul's buddy too. Anyway, yeah, we'll know about it later. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. To, I can't do it. Don't do it. I can't wait to hear about it. And I can't dude. wait to. I can't wait to tell you guys about it because I've been. I mean, it's been really hard for me to keep a lid on it this whole time. You know. But I have to, you know, it's. Oh, know. no, totally. I get it. It's like I when I play the team working on something, that's that's all I can say. I am allowed to say that. Yeah, nice. that you're working on something. Yeah, we're, we're excited to hear it. So everyone, yeah, definitely follow what you're doing, man. And man, you have a cool story. And it was fucking awesome having you take the time out. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, Thanks, man. I really there. appreciate it. No, I appreciate it, too. Thank you. Well, we'll talk again when. Uh... Well, we'll have a follow popping. up when it's not top we'll have secret a anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, follow up. That'd be good, man. We'll give you a follow up. And I'll, I'll give you. I'll give you guys a a, a, a performance too of all that stuff. Yeah, it's, man. We'll get another good story, and we'll see some performance. That'd be rad. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I got one. Of the, I got one of those iRig. Um, one of those iRig uh, uh, things where I can actually give an actual signal. Of, oh yeah, you can send a mix. Dope. Yeah. Technology. <laughs> the powers of technology. <laughs> yeah. it's it's doing pros and cons. Yeah. Well, that's, those are good. There's definitely a lot of pros and cons, but yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a lot of pros. I think the it's all it's all how you use it. Yeah, I agree. Right all on. Us, uh, all us more vintage people uh, use it more wisely. Yeah, I don't know about these kids, man. <laughs> these kids, kids today. Oh, these kids yeah. today. You know what? Best food for the brain. These kids are lucky today because I wish I had access to a lot of things that are around now. Thirty years right? ago, it's okay. You know, I have access to it now, and that's what matters. Absolutely. And on that flip side, it's like, you know, I kind of feel sorry for them because they didn't grow up with like knobs reading or knobs or like getting knobs. that vinyl and like and that's all there was or see and reading everything. Dude, I used to nerd out, like read everything, what everybody did, like oh, wow. and the artwork, like a lot of, the, you know, artwork has gone away too because they're just downloading like it. I haven't bought a CD in 15 years. Yeah. Only yeah, man. I'm still vinyl maniac. Absolutely. Vinyl. It's uh, rock. And roll sounds amazing on vinyl. And it's kind of sewer. 
even electronic music sounds great on vinyl. It's just something yeah. that with the physical movement of, of vinyl, it just lends to the harmonic distortion that you hear already yep. recorded. You know, it's yeah. adds a bit more, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's an experience, man. It's like I agree. the whole process you're pulling it out, you're putting it on your, the needle. It's like, it's a whole connoisseur process. Everything's so fast food for the brain these days. We're like that. Like I'll do a little vinyl parties, come over, like, you're going to put on the record and it's going to play. We're going to flip it and it's going to play. And that's it. There's no like we're playing this song. It's you're playing the whole fucking record where the second side sucks. Or not. 100%. The and there's a, there's yeah. a positive for, you know, I was out in my pool earlier today, listening to Pandora. Like I can bring a Bluetooth speaker out there, but the true yeah. experience of listening and having that physical thing and supporting a band that you love there is nothing like that in the whole world. So, Absolutely. Roy, man, I wish you the best of luck. I'm super fucking stoked that that you came on our show. Yeah, thank and, you. Uh, and we will talk to you again soon. <laughs> and uh, cheers, everybody. We'll see you next time. And good night. Arthur, man, that was awesome. And, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy. We got a lot of awesome stuff coming up this year. You know, we got stuff from Alfredo Hernandez. Parents. Highest Queens of Stone Age. Yes, that's correct. And we got <laughs> your your chick, amazing photographer coming up soon. Paris Viz is it Vizone? Vizoni. Vizoni. Paris Vizoni doing awesome stuff. We have been in this COVID-19 crap for a long time. Who knows how long it's gonna last? But the the ones that are creative, musicians, photographers. They never stop. I mean, Arthur, you we're persevering. Stop. We're persevering. We're, uh, we're trying. Yeah, we got a lot of good shit coming up, man. We got Ty Zamora from Alien Ant Farm and Ape Shit. <laughs> uh, that one, that one's great, man. I mean, there's some deep stuff that we talked about that uh, it, it's pretty interesting, man. Ty, Ty's a talented and a very funny motherfucker. He's awesome. Love that and guy. Follow us on Instagram at Riff Killers Podcast, and we will see you guys next week. On another episode with Arthur and I, Riff Killers Podcast. Cheers. Riff Killers Podcast. <laughs>